Well, good morning and welcome to worship as we gather as God's family in his house to sing his praises and receive his gifts of grace and mercy. We celebrate the good news that Jesus is risen from the dead and through his death and resurrection, he has given to you victory over sin, death, and the devil. As we celebrate that good news, I invite you to stand for opening hymn number 549.
We gather to worship in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen. If we say we have no sin, we deceive ourselves, and the truth is not in us. But if we confess our sins, God, who is faithful and just, will forgive our sins and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. This time we invite a kneel, sit, or stand for a time of silent reflection and self-examination. Let us then confess our sins to God our Father. Most merciful God, we confess that we are by nature sinful and unclean. We have sinned against you in thought, word, and deed, by what we have done and by what we have left undone. We have not loved you with our whole heart. We have not loved our neighbors as ourselves. We justly deserve your present and eternal punishment. For the sake of your Son, Jesus Christ, have mercy on us, forgive us, renew us, and lead us, so that we may delight in your will and walk in your ways to the glory of your holy name. Amen. Almighty God, in his mercy, has given his Son to die for you, and for his sake forgives you all your sins. As a called and ordained servant of Christ and by his authority, I therefore forgive you all your sins in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. I invite you to stand for the psalm of the day, which comes from Psalm chapter 4. We join in reading together. Answer me when I call, O God of my righteousness. You have given me relief when I was in distress. Be gracious to me and hear my prayer. O men, how long shall my honor be turned into shame? How long will you love vain words and seek after lies? But know that the Lord has set apart the godly for himself. The Lord hears when I call to him. Be angry and do not sin. Ponder in your own hearts on your beds and be silent. Offer right sacrifices and put your trust in the Lord. There are many who say, who will show us some good. Lift up the light of your face upon us, O Lord. You have put more joy in my heart than they have when their grain and wine abound. In peace I both lie down and sleep. For you alone, O Lord, make me dwell in safety. We join together in singing, This is the Feast.
be with you. Let us pray. O oh God, through the humiliation of your Son, you raised up the fallen world. Grant to your faithful people, rescued from the peril of everlasting death, perpetual gladness and eternal joys. Through Jesus Christ, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you in the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. You may be seated for the scripture readings. First reading is from Acts chapter 3. While the lame man who is now healed clung to Peter and John, all the people ran together to them in the portico called Solomon's, astounded. And when Peter saw it, he addressed the people, Men of Israel, why do you wonder at this? Or why do you stare at us as though by our own power or piety we have made him walk? The God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, and the God of Jacob, the God of our fathers, glorified his servant Jesus, whom you delivered over and denied in the presence of Pilate when he had decided to release him. But you denied the holy and righteous one and asked for a murderer to be granted to you. And you killed the author of life, whom God raised from the dead. To this we are witnesses. And his name, by faith in his name, has made this man strong, whom you see and know. And the faith that is through Jesus has given the man this perfect health in the presence of you all. And now, brothers, I know that you acted in ignorance, as did also your rulers, but what God foretold by the mouth of all the prophets, that his Christ would suffer, he thus fulfilled. Repent, therefore, and turn again, that your sins may be blotted out, that times of refreshing may come from the presence of the Lord, and that he may send the Christ appointed for you, Jesus whom heaven must receive until the time for restoring all the things about which God spoke by the mouth of his holy prophets long ago. This is the word of the Lord. The second reading is from 1 John chapter 3. See what kind of love the Father has given to us, that we should be called children of God, and so we are. The reason why the world does not know us is that it did not know him. Beloved, we are God's children now, and what we will be has not yet appeared. But we know that when he appears, we shall be like him, because we shall see him as he is. And everyone who thus hopes in him purifies himself, as he is pure. Everyone who makes a practice of sinning also practices lawlessness. Sin is lawlessness. You know that he appeared to take away sins, and in him there is no sin. No one who abides in him keeps on sinning. No one who keeps on sinning has either seen him or known him. Little children, let no one deceive you. Whoever practices righteousness is righteous as he is righteous. This is the word of the Lord. Gospel according to St. Luke, the 24th chapter. Glory to you, O Lord. As they were talking about these things, Jesus himself stood among them and said to them, Peace to you. But they were startled and frightened and thought they saw a spirit. And he said to them, Why are you troubled? And why do doubts arise in your hearts? See my hands and my feet, that it is I myself. Touch me and see. For his spirit does not have flesh and bones as you see that I have. And when he had said this, he showed them his hands and his feet. And while they still disbelieved for joy and were marveling, he said to them, Have you anything here to eat? They gave him a piece of broiled fish, and he took it and ate before them. Then he said to them, These are my words that I spoke to you while I was still with you, that everything written about me in the law of Moses and the prophets and the Psalms must be fulfilled. Then he opened their minds to understand the scriptures and said to them, thus it is written that the Christ should suffer and on the third day rise from the dead and that repentance and forgiveness of sins should be proclaimed in his name to all nations, beginning from Jerusalem. You are witnesses of these things. 
And behold, I am sending the promise of my Father upon you, but stay in the city until you are clothed with power from on high. This is the gospel of the Lord. Praise to you, O Christ. You may be seated as we join together in singing hymn number 718. I invite you to open a Bible to Luke chapter 24, our gospel reading this morning, Luke chapter 24, and as we prepare our hearts and minds to receive God's word this morning, we go to him in prayer. Our first prayer is for our own hearts and minds that the Holy Spirit would speak to us words of peace, comfort, and encouragement. Our second prayer is for our brothers and sisters in Christ, the Holy Spirit would uplift and encourage them with words of hope from the gospel of Jesus Christ. And finally, I ask that you would pray for me that I would preach faithfully and truthfully the words of Jesus and the gospel for all to hear. Psalm 19 says, May the words of my mouth and meditation my heart be acceptable and pleasing to you, O Lord, my rock and my redeemer. Amen. So we continue looking at the post-resurrection Jesus. Easter has happened, but it keeps happening. Jesus is still alive, and that's the main point of this text, is that Jesus shows up, appears to his disciples, and speaks to them, peace be to you. But they were startled and frightened, and they thought they saw a spirit. So they don't know what to make of it, right? Sometimes we think the disciples had it all figured out. Right Now, you only think that if you don't read the Bible. But if you read the Bible, you'll know that the disciples did not have it all figured out. And that even after the resurrection of Jesus, guess what? They still didn't have it all figured out. Jesus has risen. They've seen Jesus. They've heard the reports that Jesus is not in the tomb from the women, and they still struggle with it. And so Jesus shows up, right? So how many of you have ever thought, if Jesus would just show up, then... I would believe, or then I would have no doubts, then I would have no fear, whatever it might be, whatever you're struggling with, right? If Jesus would just show up right now in this moment, God would just do a miracle. So Jesus shows up. Jesus himself stood among them in verse 36 and had to say to them, peace be to you. 
But they were startled and frightened and thought they saw a spirit. So even seeing the resurrected Jesus right in front of them, they still struggled. They still had fear. They still had doubt. They were still startled. And even his first message to them, which is peace to you, doesn't calm them down, right? How many of you would be calmed down if you came to me and and wanted prayers and all I said was, you know, God's got a plan. I mean, that's kind of comforting, right, because it's true, but I'm assuming you would want me to say more than that, pray more than that, right? Just a little bit. You, don't lie. You'd walk away disappointed if that's all I did. You know, God's got a plan. Right, and Pastor, I'm really worried. I'm really concerned about this thing in my life, my job, my career, my family, whatever it might be, relationships. I go, you know, don't worry about it. Jesus said, don't worry. How many of you would go, thanks, appreciate it, but you would walk away a little upset, a little disappointed, right? And I think it's kind of funny. Jesus shows up, and he just looks at his disciples. He knows they're already scared and frightened. He knows they're already hiding because they're afraid, and he says to them, peace be to you, and it doesn't work. They're startled. They're frightened. They don't understand what is going on. And so he has to speak to them again. He goes, why are you troubled, and why do doubts arise in your hearts? Now, see, you could read this question in one or two ways. One is, wow, Jesus is being really harsh and mean with his disciples. Like, why are you doubting? Why are you? But I don't think he's doing it. I think he's pastorally approaching them, going, "Why, why do you have these doubts? Why do you have these concerns in your hearts? Don't you know that I've risen from the dead, because this is what he says to them. He speaks words of comfort to them. He says, see my hands and my feet. It is I myself. Touch me and see, for a spirit does not have flesh and bones as you see that I have. And he's speaking words of comfort to them in the midst of their startledness and their frightenedness and their misunderstanding and their doubts and their worries and concerns. Jesus speaks words of comfort and peace to you and me when we are struggling with these things. He doesn't dismiss us. He doesn't um, chastise us and go, I can't believe you've doubted. I can't believe you haven't believed. I can't believe you haven't trusted in me. He doesn't cast you aside in that way. Instead, he speaks words of comfort. He says, look at my hands and my feet and my side. See, it's me. What comfort that would bring to you if you were one of the disciples in that moment, right? Right? And it brings them so much comfort that after he showed him his hands and his feet, they still disbelieve for joy, though, and marveling, right? It's too good to be true. We don't understand fully what's happening, but we think it's amazing, right? Sometimes we don't understand fully what God is doing, but we can trust that it's amazing, that it is good, right? Romans 8 says that he works all things for the good of those who love him. Sometimes we don't understand how he's working it all together, just like the disciples didn't understand how the resurrection worked and what Jesus was doing in the moment. We're going to get to that in a little bit. But in the middle of that, he speaks to them words of comfort. He shows up in a powerful way with his resurrected body and says, see, it's me. You don't have to worry about anymore. You don't have to be frightened anymore. You don't have to doubt anymore. And then here's one of my favorite lines. Have you anything to eat? Isn't that profound? Right? Jesus is risen from the dead. He shows up, and one of the first things he says to his disciples is, I'm hungry. Now, why does that matter? Because he's, again, trying to show them what? He's real. He's flesh and blood. He's really risen from the dead. And if he's really risen from the dead, then they can really have peace and hope and comfort. And because Jesus has really risen from the dead and he got hungry and wanted something to eat, you have hope and peace and comfort as well. And so he eats in verse 43, and then he says in verse 44, these are my words that I spoke to you while I was still with you, that everything written about me in the law of Moses and the prophets and the Psalms must be fulfilled, just as it is written in verse 46, that the Christ should suffer and on the third day rise from the dead. And that repentance for the forgiveness of sins should be proclaimed in his name to all nations, beginning from Jerusalem. So Jesus looks at them, and he says, I've kept my promise. 
That's what he's saying. When he starts saying, everything that the law of Moses and the prophets and the Psalms have written about me must happen, that I must suffer and die three different times in the Gospels, he looks at his disciples and says, the Son of Man, meaning himself, is going to suffer in our place, die in our place, and then rise again from the dead. Three different times he tells them this is going to happen. And then guess what? Because of Easter, it happens. He keeps his promises. First, or 2 Corinthians chapter 1, verse 20 says that all of God's promises find their yes and their amen in Jesus. It's a great passage. It's a great comforting word from the Apostle Paul that all God's promises find their yes and their amen in Jesus. So what we see with Jesus being risen, the first thing is that he is really alive. And because he's really alive, you and I have peace and hope and comfort, even when we're startled and afraid, even when we're disbelieving and struggling with doubts. The second is that Jesus keeps his promises. Because he says, just as God's word said these things would happen, they happened. And so Jesus is making the point that I keep my promises. So when you and I are like the disciples and maybe we're overwhelmed with fear, we're struggling about the future, it's uncertain to us and it's always uncertain, we can trust in Jesus to keep his promises. And the question goes, well, why, how can I keep, trust his promises? Because he rose from the dead. He kept his promise, his greatest promise, to conquer sin and death on your behalf. And so we get to trust in Jesus to keep his promises. And then number three, and this is where I'm going to go on my little rant. So you ready for a rant this morning? (laughs) Jesus wants you to read your Bible. I'm super excited about this point because it's not just me, right? Some of you think, oh, it's just Pastor Mark always telling us to read our Bibles. But this morning, I want to show you that Jesus also wants you to read your Bible, to be in God's word. So when he says, um, this is written, everything written about me in the law of Moses and the prophets and the Psalms must be fulfilled, right? That's great comfort if you read your Bible and know the promises that God has made. You can see that Jesus has kept those promises. They've done work, scholars have done work, and there's over 63,000 prophecies and promises that were made in the Bible that point to Jesus. Right? And so he's saying, this is what has happened. And so I want you to read your Bible. In verse 45, he says, then he opened their minds to understand the scriptures. So this is Jesus wanting his disciples. He's about to ascend into heaven before them. And Jesus is looking at his disciples. He says, here's what I want for you. I want you as my disciples to be able to understand the scriptures, to understand everything that was written about me so that you can go out and share that good news and message that Son of Man suffered, died, and rose again. People go, how do you know? Because the Bible tells me so. Because we read the Bible, we understand the scriptures. So let's talk about why we want to read the Bible. In John 17, Jesus is praying for us. He's praying for future Christians, and he says, sanctify them, Lord, in your truth. Your word is truth. So Jesus is praying for you, and he's praying to the Father, and he says, I want you as my disciples to be sanctified in the truth. And then he says, your word, Father, the Father's word, the word of God, is truth. So what is he saying? He's saying, I want you to be in the word. I want you to know the word. I want you to know his promises. I want you to know his work. I want you to know what he has done for you through his word. In John chapter 5, Jesus is having a debate with the Pharisees, and he says this to them. He says, you search the scriptures because you think that in them you have eternal life, and it is they that bear witness about me, yet you refuse to come to me that you may have life. So what Jesus is saying there to the Pharisees is, you're searching the scriptures, but you're, you're kind of reading them wrong, right? There's a right way and a wrong way to read the Bible. The wrong way is the way that the Pharisees were reading, which is, we we're just going to look for a list of do's and don'ts, and if we do the do's and don't do the don'ts, we will be okay, right? Sometimes we approach the Bible and go, I just want some practical advice for life. And Jesus says, no, that's not what you're going to get out of the Scriptures. What you're ultimately going to get out of the Scriptures is Jesus. He's saying, look, when you search the Scriptures, if you find me, and if you find Jesus, you have life. So the first reason to read the Bible, to be in God's Word, is so that you can get Jesus. And through Jesus, you could have life and hope. In Romans chapter 15, we get our second reason to read the scriptures. 
St. Paul writes, for whatever was written in the past, meaning the Old Testament, was written for our instruction so that we might have hope through endurance and through the encouragement from the scripture. So Paul is saying, I want you to read the Bible because through the Bible you have hope and encouragement. How many of you want hope and encouragement in your life for the future? Right? So we have two reasons to read the Bible. We get Jesus, and through Jesus we get life, and then we also read the scriptures because through them, Paul says, you will have hope and encouragement. Now, what I know what you're thinking, how many of you are experts in the Bible and you understand everything you read? I don't either. So I want to encourage you to get a couple of helps that will help you understand because even the disciples didn't understand what was happening. It took verse 45, what had happened. Jesus opened their minds to understand the scriptures, right? So a couple of helps. One is um, from CPH, the Lutheran Study Bible, right? Or you can get another study Bible. Study Bibles are wonderful tools to use where the bottom part of the page has all kinds of footnotes and extra notes there to help you understand and guide you. A lot of them have introductions to books of the Bible to understand the major themes of what they're about, who wrote them, when, and all kinds of things like that. So it sounds simple, but getting a good study Bible, like a Lutheran study Bible, is a big help in terms of your devotion life and your being in the scripture and going, I'm starting to understand it more, rather than just going, well, this is frustrating. All right, another one, and you can look at this book after, just meet me out in the narthex. This is a book from CPH called The Messianic Message. It was written by a couple of my former professors at seminary, and what it does is it simply walks you through the whole Bible to point out how the Old Testament, from the Law of Moses, the Prophets, and the Psalms, points you to Jesus. So this is a book called The Messianic Message, and so that's from CPH. But those are just a couple simple tools that you could get to say, I want to understand God's word better. I want to be in God's word more, make it more approachable. You could come to Bible class after service. We go through books of the Bible. You can learn how to read the Bible and be encouraged in God's word in that way. But there's another thing that I want you to do. Uh, Charles Spurgeon was once asked, what is more important, praying or reading the Bible? And his answer was, what's more important, breathing in or breathing out? And the answer meaning, you need both. We need prayer to be in contact and communication with God, pouring ourselves out to him, but we need to be in God's word, having him pour into us as well. So two ways to pray before you read the Bible, right? I would encourage you to pray before you open God's word. And the first is this, it comes from verse 45. Then Jesus opened their minds to understand the scriptures. Just pray that Bible verse. Just say, Lord, I'm, I'm about to read the scriptures. Please open my mind to understand what I'm about to read. Just like you did for the apostles, will you do that for me? Will you please open my mind to understand the scriptures? And the second is similar. We pray to the Holy Spirit. In John chapter 16, Jesus says this, when the spirit of truth comes, he will guide you into all the truth. For he will not speak on his own authority, but whatever he hears, he will speak. And he will declare to you the things that are to come. So when the spirit of truth comes, he will guide you into all truth. And earlier in John 17, we read that God's word is truth. So we pray to the spirit and say, Holy Spirit, would you guide me in understanding what is the truth of God's word? What is this passage teaching me about God? What is it teaching me about Jesus? What is it teaching me about my relationship with him, right? We want to know the truth of God's word. So it's two simple prayers. Jesus, will you open my mind to understand the scriptures? And Holy Spirit, will you guide me into the truth of the scriptures? And then number three is a prayer to share the Bible because Jesus opens their minds to understand the scriptures, but not just so that they can have a Bible study. Now, that'd be a really cool Bible study, wouldn't it? You got the 11 apostles, Peter, James, John, and Andrew, the leaders there, and you got Jesus leading it. How many of you, if it wasn't me leading the Bible study, but Jesus leading the Bible study, would probably come? <laughs> right? I mean, it hurts, only hurts my feelings a little bit. But you're probably more likely to show up, right? If we were advertising on our website, we have two Bible studies. One's led by Pastor Mark. The other's led by Jesus. It's probably going to be me. My wife is going to the one with Jesus, right? It's <laughs> this is a cool Bible study. But that's not the point of the story, is it? 
Because Jesus doesn't just say, okay, we're gonna sit here. I've helped you understand the scriptures. Let's talk about what it means to you now. He doesn't do that. Instead, he says, thus it is written, verse 46, that the Christ should suffer and on the third day rise from the dead and that repentance for the forgiveness of sins should be proclaimed in his name to all nations beginning from Jerusalem and you are witnesses of these things. What does a witness do? A witness says, here's what I've seen, here's what I've heard. They go and tell people. So Jesus is saying, I've helped you understand the scriptures, not so you can keep it to yourself, but so that you can share it. So here's a prayer to pray as we share the scriptures with the world. Mark chapter 13, Jesus says, be on your guard, for they will deliver you over to the councils, and you will be beaten in the synagogues, and you will stand before governors and kings for my sake to bear witness before them. And the gospel must first be proclaimed to all nations. And when they bring you to trial and deliver you over, do not be anxious beforehand what you are to say, but say whatever is given you in that hour, for it is not you who speak, but the Holy Spirit. Now, you might not be arrested. You might not be standing trial for your faith and and that kind of persecution that they were facing. But I know from personal experience where I've gotten nervous before conversations that it it feels like you're standing trial, right? It it feels like you're under a lot of pressure. It feels like everything hinges on getting these words right. And Jesus is saying, I don't want you to be anxious about it, which is always great advice from God. Don't worry, right? It's always nice when God says, don't worry about something. And it's like, well, you're God, we're not. But why does he say, don't worry about it, don't be anxious about it? Because he says the Holy Spirit will give you the words. Now, there's two ways the Holy Spirit gives you the word. One is just praying this verse, just silently praying it on inside your mind and in your thoughts and saying, okay, Holy Spirit, I'm being asked questions I don't know the answer to, or I'm nervous about this conversation that's about to happen. Holy Spirit, give me the words to share with this person. Another way of being prepared is being in God's word. If I know God's promises, if I knew the truth of scripture, then I have something to share with them because what were they sharing? What was Jesus telling the disciples to share? What they had seen and heard, what the scriptures had taught about Jesus. And so two things to pray to share the Bible. One is Holy Spirit, give me the words to speak in this moment. The second is knowing God's word, knowing the words and the story of Jesus to share. One last thing, First Peter famously says, always prepared to give a reason for the hope that is in you. Anybody heard that passage before? Familiar with it? The follow-up is this, but do so with gentleness and kindness and respect. So we wanna go out into the world And we want to be the salt and light. We want to be kind and gentle and respectful in sharing the word of God. We don't want to beat people up. We don't want to knock them over the head with a Bible and knock them out. We want to uplift them and encourage them and invite them to know the risen Savior, to know the Jesus who died for them, who rose for them, and who loves them. Let's pray. Lord Jesus, we give thanks for your grace and mercy in our lives. We give thanks that you suffered and died in our place and most importantly, that you rose from the dead. We give thanks that you have kept all the promises of God, and we know that you will keep all the future promises as well. Help us, Lord, to understand the scriptures, to be in your word faithfully, so we may know the truth, and that we will be able to go out into the world as your disciples, sharing that truth of your death and resurrection and your love for the whole world. In your name we pray, amen. This time I invite you to stand as we confess our Christian faith using the words of the Nicene Creed. We confess together. I believe in one God, the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and of all things visible and invisible, and in one Lord Jesus Christ, the only begotten Son of God, begotten of his Father before all worlds, God of God, light of light, very God of very God, begotten, not made, being of one substance with the Father, by whom all things were made, who for us men and for our salvation came down from heaven and was incarnate by the Holy Spirit of the Virgin Mary and was made man, 
and was crucified also for us under Pontius Pilate. He suffered and was buried, and the third day he rose again according to the scriptures, and ascended into heaven, and sits at the right hand of God the Father. And he will come again with glory to judge both the living and the dead, whose kingdom will have no end. And I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Lord and giver of life, who proceeds from the Father and the Son, who with the Father and the Son together is worshiped and glorified, who spoke by the prophets. And I believe in one holy Christian apostolic church. I acknowledge one baptism for the remission of sins, and I look for the resurrection of the dead and the life of the world to come. Amen. We go to our God in prayer. Let us pray for the whole church of God in Christ Jesus and for all people according to their needs. Lord God, in your presence, we find fullness of joy. And by your right hand, Christ Jesus, you win and deliver peace forevermore. In the midst of this world's sins and sorrows, give us peace in the knowledge of his salvation and confident hope in the resurrection of the dead. Lord, in your mercy. Amen. Heavenly Father, by the incarnation of your Son and the reconciliation of his cross, you have made us your children and gathered us into your holy church, sustain the preaching of your holy word and its message of repentance for the forgiveness of sins, in Jesus' name among us and all the nations of the world. Lord, in your mercy. Give peace, O Lord, to our homes and enliven them by Christ's resurrected life. Let the forgiveness of sins reign among husbands and wives, parents and children. Assure those who live alone that they too are your children, upheld by your right hand. Lord, in your mercy. God of all comfort, you have compassion on those who are afflicted. Remember and have mercy on all those in need of your healing and deliverance. Lord, in your mercy. Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, by your son's crucifixion, all sins have been blotted out. Send us now the blessed refreshment of his bodily presence in the sacrament of the altar and make us fit partakers in repentance for the forgiveness of our sins. Lord, in your mercy. Into your hands, O Lord, we commend all for whom we pray, trusting in your mercy through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. You may be seated as we present our tithes and offerings to the Lord. Thank you. 
I'd like you to stand for the singing of the offertory. Lord be with you. Lift up your hearts. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. It is truly good, right, and salutary that we should all times and all places give thanks to you, Holy Lord, Almighty Father, everlasting God. And most especially are we bound to praise you on this day for the glorious resurrection of your Son, Jesus Christ, the very Paschal Lamb who was sacrificed for us and bore the sins of the world. By his dying, he has destroyed death, and by his rising again, he has restored to us everlasting life. Therefore, with Mary Magdalene, Peter, and John, with all the witnesses of the resurrection, with angels and archangels, with all the company of heaven, we laud and magnify your glorious name, evermore praising you and saying, Blessed are you, Lord of heaven and earth, for you have had mercy on those whom you created and sent your only begotten Son into our flesh to bear our sin and be our Savior. With repentant joy, we receive the salvation accomplished for us by the all-availing sacrifice of his body and his blood on the cross. Gathered in the name and the remembrance of Jesus, we beg you, O Lord, to forgive, renew, and strengthen us with your word and spirit. Grant us faithfully to eat his body and drink his blood as he bids us do in his own testament. Gather us together, we pray, from the ends of the earth to celebrate with all the faithful the marriage feast of the Lamb in his kingdom, which has no end. Graciously receive our prayers, deliver and preserve us. To you alone, O Father, be all glory, honor, and worship with the Son and the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. Amen. Lord, remember us in your kingdom and teach us to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not to temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. Our Lord Jesus Christ, the night was betrayed, took bread. When he gave thanks, he broke it and gave it to the disciples, said, Take, eat. This is my body, which is given for you. This do in remembrance of me. In the same way, also, he took the cup after supper. And when he had given thanks, he gave it to them, saying, Drink of it, all of you. This cup is the New Testament in my blood, which is shed for you for the forgiveness of sins. This do as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. The peace of the Lord be with you always.
Please stand and receive the communion blessing. This true body and blood of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ, strengthen and preserve in your faith to life everlasting. Go in his peace. Amen. We join together in singing, Thank the Lord. give thanks to you, almighty God, that you refreshed us through this sanitary gift, and we implore you that of your mercy you would strengthen us to the same in faith toward you and in fervent love toward one another, through Jesus Christ, your Son, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you in the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. Amen. A couple announcements before the benediction. One is that our preschool spring fling is on April 27th at 4.30 p.m., so that's a couple of Saturdays from now, April 27th. At 4.30 p.m., you might have noticed out in the narthex, we have pictures of the baskets, so there will be a raffle as a fundraiser for our preschool and the kids that, and the families that are impacted by that mission and ministry, and so you are able to buy raffle tickets on your way out today, this Sunday and next Sunday, and you'll also be able to buy raffle tickets the day of the spring fling, and so you can look at the baskets, you can pick a different strategy, you can buy a ticket for each basket, you can buy 20 tickets for one basket if you really want a pie. Right, like it's up to you, right? But whatever you do, um, all those proceeds go to support this preschool mission and ministry here at Our Savior and all the families that are impacted by with that. Um, our next announcement, I invite Patty to come forward. She's gonna say a few words on behalf of the construction committee. Hi there, good morning. I'm sorry you're standing up. Um, <laughs> well, I just wanted to give you a quick uh, update. We're really excited on the next phase we're going in. There's three major phases of a project like this and it's your design phase where you know we go over and over and over it there's the bidding and permitting phase which is the meat and potatoes of it and then hitting the road with the construction um, so as of Monday we were ready to go in bidding and permitting so this is very cool um, it's about a four to six week process so we're looking at uh, launching construction boots on the ground June um, so we're excited about that, and if everything goes good, um, we could complete in October, November. So be ready for the holidays. Um, today, we have a very detailed handout for you that you'll get as you leave. Um, so please take that. We want to educate you on where we are right now. And then in May, uh, mid-May to end of May, we'll have the big renditions again on the changes. There's been a few changes because structural engineers have come in and, and our, our church couldn't handle some of the original design ideas. And so we've made some tweaks to that, uh, but we sure you're gonna love it. So please take your hand out today, thank you. Thank you, Patty. As you go today, go in the blessing and the peace of the Lord. The Lord bless you and keep you. Lord, make his face shine upon you and be gracious to you. Lord, look upon you with favor and give you his peace. Amen. Amen.